Akil, yes. after taking the History of China course, uh -huh. what is the most important uh -huh. thing that you have taken away? Uh -huh. uh, well, <laughs> there are a lot of trends and patterns throughout uh, China's history. Um, and it's, it's cool because in class we have a chance to explore these, these patterns and stuff. Hi, Angela. And I think, I, I really appreciate Mr. Burrell giving us, you know, the, the chance to actually discover new things about Chinese history. And um, so starting off really quickly, one important pattern that I found really interesting was the evolution of China's, um, of, of China's relations to foreign powers starting from, you know, uh, from, from 1000 all the way up to the PRC and Mao Zedong. And I think, personally, I think that uh, the main aversion towards foreign powers and their influences started uh, when the Ming Dynasty, or the I'm sorry, the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongols conquered China because it was the first it was the first non-Chinese uh, people to actually rule China. It, so so it was a foreign power ruling a local land for them. And I think when the Ming Dynasty overthrew them, they they really realized what the negative effects of were foreign power. They started realizing what the negative effects were um, because the UN dynasty actually kicked off the fall of wave three, um, which is a major turning point in Chinese history. And I think then after that, when when um, when the Manchus started, when the, when the Manchus conquered in 1644, I think it was 1645, and then when and then the British conquered, the Japanese conquered. All of these things just kept piling on China. Uh, the century of humiliation, where they were sliced up into pieces um, because of because of their revolts and stuff. The opium trade just completely crushed them, uh, into, in so socially and economically. So I think all these all these foreign influences is piling on and and constantly driving them under. Um, and also, Kangxi when he uh, when he um, expelled the Christians from China in the during the Qing Dynasty, during the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, I think that was a major turning point because, and it was warranted because he tried to reason with them, but then after, um, but then, but then obviously he knew the history of China, his, uh, the, of the influence of the Yuan Dynasty coming in and and starting the fall of the actual fall of Wave Three, so that decision was warranted. And then again, as I said, all these things piling on the British, the Japanese, um, World War Two, and all that stuff. I think it just today it's translated into into not necessarily a friendly view towards um, not just foreign powers, not just Westerners, but foreign powers in general. And I think that the government's policy of concentrating on taking only what's good, only what's good of Western and foreign powers and bringing them into the society and not actually completely, uh, completely assimilating like a Western culture, I think that's a great idea because, because again, we've seen the negative effects of um, We've seen the negative effects of, of foreign powers. Do you, so, do you believe that there are only negative effects from these foreign powers, or is there any? Case no, definitely not. Because again, as the, the Chinese government, um, they've they've chosen to, they they are not they're not completely averse to to foreign powers. I mean, recent recent um, news re recent news studies like the the cellist on the on the train and the the drunk Westerner trying to rape a, trying to rape a Chinese woman in the streets. And then, and the reactions by the Chinese men and women in the streets, I think it's indicative of how some Chinese, how some Chinese men and women might react to foreign powers. But it's not exactly how the whole, it's not exactly how the whole country as a, as a culture and as a national state really views Chinese religion. Uh, Chinese really view. It's not, it's not indicative of how the whole Chinese country views foreign powers. Um, but obviously, the Chinese government. Do see some things really because, as, as Mr. Burrell said, they're crossing the river by feeling the stones. So they are looking to, to find positive aspects of different foreign powers and Western culture, and I think it's a great way to, you know, advance their society. Looking back on Chinese history and throughout the timeline of what you've explored this year, do you think China would have been better off without the influence from these foreign powers, or do you think that the foreign powers have made China into a better nation today? I think I think they've I think they've made them into a better nation because, first of all, they 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 made China aware of what was happening around them. They before before I mean before all these Western influ, uh, foreign powers influences and and all their conquerings, China really well, it was kind of isolated geographically and also culturally with the rest of the world. And I mean for example, take the Xiongnu who uh, invaded the Han Dynasty. Without the Xiongnu, the China wouldn't have expanded their Great Wall territory into the Silk Road. They wouldn't have made that entry into the trading world of 
of, of that time, uh, of dur during the Han Dynasty. So yeah, definitely foreign powers have influenced China a lot in terms of, I mean, in, 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 all, in all aspects, politically, socially, culturally, politically, because, I mean, we see today uh, there are Chinese the Chinese politicians, even in the Communist Party, looking to create a more democratic kind of voting system because they know that since Mao, since the, the what's it called, in inheritance policy of Mao, when, when they were trying to choose who was going to be successor, Zhou Enlai or Deng, Deng, uh, Deng, Ping, Deng, Deng Xiaoping, uh, I mean, I mean it, it's, it's clear, clear to see how they would, they would change some of their policies to adapt not to only the changing, the changing world in these days, but just to, how to make their, their society a better one. Wow. And I mean, again, in terms of government, politically, I think there, 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 there lies another pattern because um, if you recall Confucian, uh, Confucius said that to be a good ruler you have to be, um, well, I mean, personally I think Mao uh, in particular really assimilated all kinds of Chinese philosophies in order to be the ruler that, he, he, that we see him as today. For example, he took some Confucian ideals in ruling as as uh, the wind blows the grass, like Confucius said. Um, and if, if you recall, he, as he was driving past uh, a little village, he said, communes are good, people should live in communes. And overnight, people, people converted, uh, people, you know, made the commune. So it shows just the power of his influence as a ruler. And also he incorporated Taoist ideals, um, because a lot, for, for a huge part during his rule, he, he didn't come out, nobody could see him, nobody, Nobody knew that he was an active part. I mean, they knew he was an active part of society and decision making, but nobody actually saw his face. So he ruled like a shadow, which is what Taoism preached. Um, and I think this transition between like Confucianism and Taoism, which have stretched back all the way to the Warring States period, I think it shows. It, it, it just, it's just—it's really ironic that even though like uh, Qin, uh, Qin, Qin Shi Huangdi, and Mao Zedong, in fact, have both tried to, have both tried to, you know get rid of Confucian, like Chen tried to burn down the Confucian classics and Mao tried to tried also the Cultural Revolution to get rid of any Western influence, to get rid of the art. It's, it's funny because they both still used Confucianism in their policies and in their teachings. Uh, so I think that transition is really cool. Okay, to wrap it up, is there any last comments you have on anything you've learned this year? Um, well, another thing about government, <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just forgot about this. It's 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 funny because the the main thing about the the government changes is the fact that I I, don't, I forgot who said it but natural disasters uh, are indicative again of a bad ruler and that has repeated itself so many times throughout Chinese history. For example, in the um, uh, I for, uh, I think it was the Xin Interregnum. I think be between the Han dynasties, uh, the which was for I think uh, it wasn't a very long dynasty. It was just a little. Um, it was um, what was this thing? It, it, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't a long. It was called an interregnum for a reason, and um, uh, it's and it's cool because that ruler, he made you know he made many changes to the Han Dynasty, the end of the, uh, the Western Han, and in the end he got ousted because he because of a uh, of the changing the changing Yellow River, which changed of course and it just flooded the whole region, and the people viewed that as as indicative of the of the Xin Dynasty ruler being a bad ruler. And then again, a few year, a f just a few years ago, um, towards the end of Mao's reign, the Tangshan earthquake, people, as we saw in the documentary, people right after that earthquake just, just lost faith in Mao because they, they, they thought he was infallible. And obviously he wasn't because an er a major earthquake had just hit China and killed and displaced so many people. And they just lost their faith in him. And that's why, I, and I, I think that transition between, so again, with Confucianism and Taoism, these old ideals back from so long ago being transitioned and, and being present in today's society, I think that's, that's really great of, of, of China. That's and a wrap.